As usual, uh, we are a little bit behind, uh, uh, behind uh, the time, so please don't waste it. Let's start the first panel on the academic uh, freedom. And the host, the moderator of, today's, uh, of this first panel is Mr. Professor David Engels. Please welcome him with, uh, with applause. To będzie pan, pan profesor David Engels tutaj, Instytut Zachodni. To jest to miejsce, w którym profesor David Engels, Instytut for Western Affairs, that's where he works on a daily basis. Ja może nie chcę uprzedzać. I don't want to. Your seat is here. Excuse me. Your seat is here. Okay, tak, to jest to. Oh, okay, you can take a seat anywhere, anywhere you want. So, this is your time. I would like to ask that two of our today's panelists are joining us online, but uh, I think uh, Professor Engels will uh, uh, present all the guests today. I would like to please stick to the time set. Please don't pass your time, if I can ask you. 45 minutes, okay? We've got 45 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> so, your excellencies, Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your presence during the inauguration of the Collegium Intermarium and your enthusiasm in supporting this project. The times are hard for free thinking and research, and the opening <coughs> of a new university addressing these problems is more than welcome. I am David Engels, Professor for Roman History at the University of Brussels, as well as Research Professor at the Institut Zachodni in Poznan and Professor at the Academy of Gorzów Wielkopolski, and very happy to lead you through this panel on the situation of academic freedom in the modern world. Anyone who has followed the development of the academic world in recent years, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, can hardly have failed to notice the extent to which an ideologization of research and teaching has occurred that would have been considered absurd just 20 years ago. What has been considered classical teaching material for decades in certain subjects for centuries has now been condemned and brushed aside as misogynic and racist ideas of old white men, while in return, third-rate authors and anachronistic research questions have been brought to the fore, which, while offering little in the way of insights and even less in the way of relevance in making the Western educational heritage fruitful for the next generation, enjoy the highest political protection and make it possible for certain researchers to showcase the extent to which they are on the allegedly right side of history. And this right side is very obviously on the left. Now, one would think that in the wide world of universities, there should be enough space to avoid political appropriation and to conduct normal, non-political research in peace and quiet. But this space is gradually shrinking. Texts that offend because they are allegedly anti-democratic, misogynistic, racist or Islamophobic, such as Plato, Ovidius, Chaucer or Dante, are given trigger warnings, are censored or even removed from course materials, libraries systematically destroy all books that have not been sufficiently consulted, that is made compulsory reading by professors in recent years. Only what is classified as academically and ideologically unobjectionable by at least three colleagues in a peer review process is published. Project funds are only approved if they contain appropriate catchwords such as diversity, migration, tolerance, privilege, gender, climate or inclusiveness together with the appropriate topic. Papers are not evaluated according to their content, but according to the ranking of the journals in which they are printed. Vacant positions are largely distributed to members of various minorities in order to fulfill the quotas imposed from above. And even those who yesterday believed they had a permanent position can now lose it if they do not regularly provide evidence of creditable publications and third-party funding all, all of which are inextricably linked to the corresponding ideological co-towing and personal decisions. 
In short, academic freedom now only applies to those who demonstrate the appropriate cultural awareness. All others have to put up with having even their apolitical stance interpreted as complicity in the continued existence of a system based on white male privilege, with absurd consequences. The classics recently even called for their own abolition because they were allegedly structurally linked to the ideological foundations of white supremacy. The venerable International Society of Anglo-Saxonists had to drop the reference to the namesake Anglo-Saxons in order to better deal with racism, sexism, inclusiveness and representation. In American schools such as in Oregon, the arithmetic errors of students of color are no longer to be marked as the search for the only right answer is thought to be a typical instrument of white superiority. And even hitherto rather left-wing and feminist thinkers and politicians like Sarah Wagenknecht or Svenja Flaspöhler increasingly have to face the accusation of being reactionary if they no longer go along with the latest vaults of the cult of victimhood, permanent offensiveness and cancel culture. The revolution is beginning to eat its own children. Isn't it enough, some observers may ask, to sit back and relax for a few years and watch political correctness reduce itself to absurdity and then rebuild academia on a moderate basis? No, because the universities today are merely reaping the fruits of a cause that often goes back many decades and has conditioned the entire academic system in the sense of relativism and ultra-liberalism. Popper's idea that only that which can be utterly falsified is also truly scientific has caused enormous damage, especially in the humanities, because in the last instance it replaced truth with quotation frequency and quantifying bibliometrics and created a system or a situation of permanent academic competition where the right of the stronger, that is the politically more correct scholar, reigns sovereign. And where truth is negated and regarded as a purely provisional majority decision, it is logical that the financing of research is also handed over to competition for money from free enterprise and politicized funds, with the disastrous consequence that scientists have been forced by their universities to become first managers, then ideological sycophants, in order to be able to carry out their activities. Lord, the need is great, those spirits I called I cannot now get rid of, one would be tempted to say in the words of Goethe's famous sorceress apprentice. Therefore, the hope for return to the status quo ante is illusory. On the one hand, because we are currently facing the rise of a new academic elite that is not interested in factual issues, but in political attitudes and will be incapable of returning to the previous state of affairs in a few years. On the other hand, because the actual cause for the current undesirable developments has not come from outside, but from within. Hence, what is needed is a radical rethinking of what science is supposed to be about in the first place, a new Carolingian reform of education that puts the freedom and security of the scholar the guarantee of his unchallenged interest in fundamental questions and the integration of his research into a superordinate pursuit of truth and beauty once more at the center and thus returns to the sense of the original holistic universitas. Today we are further away from this than ever and the solution will probably not come from the universities themselves but will have to be one step by step through the foundation and impact of new institutions and academies that once again place research and self-development and not output and training in the foreground, exactly as endeavors to do the Collegium Intermarium. Now, after these short words of introduction and of context, let's have a more thorough look at the situation of freedom of speech and research in the modern West. I'm very happy and proud to welcome an impressive array of colleagues and friends from all over Europe on my panel. Let me first introduce you to Professor Andreas Kinneging. 
professor of legal philosophy at the University of Leiden and a well-known conservative philosopher in the Netherlands, who was one of the main agents in resuscitating classical conservatism in the Netherlands and was very active in the highly successful think tank and educational group, the Edmund Burke Foundation and the well-known Center for European Renewal. De Andreas, what is the situation of academic freedom in the modern West and what can we do to save it? Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, thank, thank you for having me. I'm very sorry that I could not come personally, uh, and I will try to do my best to be understandable via Zoom. Uh, Western societies have a big problem, and that problem is called the universities. This institution, where all the people are educated, will in time occupy the most influential positions in society and hence to a large extent determine the direction society will take is everywhere in the West in the grip of a pernicious way of thinking that is referred to by its adherents as liberalism but has in fact very little in common with traditional liberalism uh, for traditional liberals, liberty is the most important thing. For the self-proclaimed liberals who set the tone at the contemporary university, not liberty, but equality is the highest value. Not equality before the law, the aspiration of the American and French Revolution, and one of the foundations of Western society in the past 200 years. Neither equality of opportunity, a much more radical ideal of an equal start in life for everyone. No, it is an even more radical nation, the notion these liberals champion, the equality of outcome. If there are more male professors than female, this, according to them, is unjust. There should be as many female professors as male, because there are as many women as men in the world. The same goes for color of skin, sexual preference, ethnic or religious background, etc. Every category has the right to a proportional representation. If such equality is lacking, that is proof of discrimination and sufficient reason for the state to intervene by law and policy. Moreover, anyone opposing such laws and policies is regarded as an arrest. He is immediately branded as a sexist, racist, homophobe, etc. And it is demanded, often successfully, that he be fired from his job. As a result, everyone not in agreement with these so-called liberals is scared to death, keeps his mouth shut, and if put under pressure, will betray their convictions and just go along in order to avoid nasty consequences for themselves. Now, what does this radical egalitarianism remind us of? Of communism, of course. It is ex the exact same way of thinking, the only difference being that equality is no longer applied to classes, but instead to sex, race, sexual preference, etc. More in general, the contemporary liberals, i.e. communists, like Marx, see all of history as a struggle between oppressors and oppressed. Good people side with the oppressed in this struggle, in which every means is said to be allowed and even necessary. Otherwise, things will never change. The elimination of free speech is what we are experiencing right now, but it is probably only the beginning. Marx explicitly condoned violence, and so do his followers today. So what is awaiting us in the future? Re-education camps, from this point of view, are an excellent idea. And what to do with stubborn counter-revolutionaries? Well, you put them away for good, obviously. The universities play a major, no, a crucial role in these developments. This radical egalitarianism is no new thing there. Here is a quote from Fukuyama's 1992 bestseller, The End of History and the Last One. Already, Fukuyama says, forms of inequality such as racism, sexism, and homophobia 
have displaced the traditional class issue for the left on contemporary American college campuses. This was 30 years ago. At the time, this was the lunatic fringe. Most people shrugged their shoulders and went on with their lives. But the lunatic fringe kept on lecturing about these things, converting more and more generations of students and appointing more and more people like them in vacant academic positions. What we are experiencing right now is the result of at least 30 years of preaching and scheming. It is in a sense the revenge of the communists for their defeat in 1989. How could this have happened? Too few people paid attention. Everyone was too busy with his own work in his own field. And this didn't seem a view that needed to be taken very seriously. That was a mistake indeed. However, all of this does not explain why these ideas managed to convert so many young people. The reason for that can only be that there is something very attractive in them. Again, just like the original communism. That too was very attractive to many people. Why? Because the equality of all is a tremendously appealing ideal. Lenin and his friends set out to establish the land of milk and honey in 1970. And they achieved exactly the opposite of what they had dreamed of. Not heaven, but hell on earth. That is what the ideal of the equality of all leads to, if it is put in practice. Hell on earth. Tocqueville had already told his readers so in, 19, in 1835, but no one listened very well. The practical experience of the era 1970-1989, on the other hand, did teach a lot of people this lesson. But now, 30 years on, the lesson is forgotten again. The experience of communism is no longer living memory, at least in the West, where young and also middle-aged people have little or no idea uh, or, and, and little or no interest. The first and last time Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago was published in my country, the Netherlands, was in the 1970s. I tried to convince various publishers recently that it is time for a republication, to no avail. We need to do something about that. We need to teach the young about the truth of so-called liberalism and of communism. We need to teach them that the equality of all, appearances notwithstanding, is not a good idea after all, because it leads to totalitarian tyranny. That is to the loss of liberty and what is even more important to the loss of the pursuit of excellence, of virtus. We need to teach them that in many ways inequality is a good or at least an acceptable thing because it is part and parcel of a good society, a society of free men and women striving for moral and intellectual excellence. All of this means that we have to reconquer the universities. And if that is impossible, we need to set up our own, such as the Collegium Intermarium. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Many thanks for, for this statement, dear Andreas. I will now turn to our next participant, Professor Michael Sommer, since 2012 Professor for Ancient History at the University of Oldenburg and an old friend. Professor Sommer has not only a very large expertise in the fields of Roman socio-economic and identity history and is the author of several books, he is also one of the leading members of the newly founded German Netzwerk für Wissenschaftsfreiheit, Network for Academic Freedom, to which I also belong, an institution committed to defending the importance of free and controversial debate in all academic fields and to opposing increasing moral political constrictions. Dear Michael, how would you analyze the present situation from your point of view and how can academic freedom be guaranteed for the future? 
David, thank you very much. Um, I apologize for not being able to be with you uh, due to the pandemic. Um, academics in Poland and Germany alike are living in an ideal world, at least theoretically. Both our countries have constitutions that explicitly guarantee academic freedom. Article 73 of the Constitution of the Republic of Poland says the freedom of academic research and to publish its result is granted to everyone. Similarly, Article 5, Sentence 3 of the German Grundgesetz rules the freedom of academic teaching and research. Academic freedom being explicitly entrenched in a country's constitution is relatively uncommon. Most constitutions subsume the freedom of research and teaching under the heading of free speech. In this short paper, I'm going to ask what academic freedom means and by whom it is threatened. Who can claim academic freedom and for what kind of activity? Who's got to protect it and how? And who is currently compromising it as the fact that academic freedom is being compromised can hardly be disputed. First, academic freedom is a right of the individual against the state. It means that it is the government's responsibility to make sure that whoever engages in research and academic teaching is unharmed by any attempts at infringing their activities, as long as they are themselves constitutional. Can an academic who descends into the political arena and agitates, say, for the boycott Israel movement, claim academic freedom? No, because they have left the space of academia and entered a different one, protected merely by free speech. Can a researcher who is promoting creationism, chemtrails, or the idea that the Earth is flat claim academic freedom? Most likely not, since all such nonsense is in blatant disagreement with scientifically proven facts and well outside the parameters of what can be considered state of the art. You gather where this is going. What if things are not as unequivocal as in the chemtrail or flat Earth supposition? What, for instance, if the climatologist holds a minority position in the debate on climate change? Or if one field of research, say gender studies, departs from propositions that would be described by experts of another field, biology, for example, as utterly unscientific? In my opinion, the only answer to that question, which will not be leading into aporia, is a radically libertarian one. Research and teaching can be performed in any field of academia, and it is academic as long as it, it, it adheres to a clearly defined set of methodologies. Both the gender studies researcher and the climatologist can therefore claim academic freedom as long as they uh, stick to a set, set of uh, rules and methodology. Whoever rejects a radically libertarian approach to academic freedom will have to explain as to why they privilege certain schools of thought and certain disciplines over others. Second, what responsibilities arise from academic freedom for the government? A, it goes without saying that the government has the obligation to refrain from all attempts to compromise the freedom of researchers. This would be the case when government policy defines research questions and objectives, but also where it excludes or privileges certain constituencies on the grounds of race or gender, for instance. A sensitive question in this respect would be as to whether one should go as far as calling the imposition of, say, of a, say, equal opportunities code a breach of academic freedom. At least we are dealing with conflicting constitutional objectives here. Does the government responsibility for academic freedom prevent the government and or legislators from prioritizing research activity one over research activity two? No, policymakers are free to decide which research to fund and what priorities to set. If a government decides to prioritize sustainable energy research over, say, for example, classical studies, go ahead, they are free to do so. It may be a different thing if the granting of research funding is subject to condition, conditions such as preferential employment of women or economic employ, uh, exploitability of research results. Again, this may be a matter of competing constitutional values. B. Governments are under obligation 
to provide for climate at universities and research institutions where individual academic freedom is not infringed by any third party. Should, for example, activists make an attempt at preventing me from giving my talk this morning, the government must make sure that my academic freedom and that of my hosts will not be at risk. At state universities, the government is represented by the university leadership towards the professors and by the professors towards all other members of faculty. At private institutions, similar mechanisms ought to be in place. Third, who is a threat to academic freedom? At present, in my country, as well as in the US, the UK, and most Western European countries, the activism of left-leaning identitarians forms the single most formidable menace to academic freedom. While in the US, a single word can easily cost you your job, the situation is still a lot better in Europe. The platforming attempts usually target invited speakers, not the professional existence of academics as such. In Germany, there have been relatively few such attempts, and in the overwhelming majority of cases, further damage has been averted by the university leadership. This means that the institutional safeguarding of the individual right of academic freedom is still largely effective despite all prophecies of bloom. However, it cannot be excluded that the pressure exerted by activists triggers self-censoring mechanisms within the academic community. Will someone who has got into trouble inviting a fellow academic as a guest speaker extend another invitation to his main colleague? Could something I'm saying in my lecture wreak havoc over my future career? Will a too outspoken remark alienate me from my colleagues? That one has to be aware of such risks points to the uncomfortable truth that the infringement and defense of academic freedom starts in the pre-institutional field where the spiral of silence is being set in motion because we prefer not to be heroes. This being said, the protection of the individual right of academic freedom depends as much on the individual as it does on the government. What are we supposed to do? We have to make public the names of those who agitate against our freedom, as they usually act clandestinely. We have to move the topic up the public agenda, as university leaderships will feel more pressure to act on our behalf when they realize that there is public awareness. We have to vouch for our colleagues if they are targeted by those who are enemies of academic freedom, as safety lies in numbers. In short, we have to do what academics usually prefer not to do, take up the fight which had been, has been forced upon us and show that we have some bones. Thank you very much and Godspeed for the Collegio Mariano, Inter Mariano. Many thanks for these kind words, dear Michael. Let us now step from the diagnosis to prognostics. Our new or next uh, distinguished speaker is Rod Dreher, an American writer and editor who is senior editor and blogger at the American Conservative, out of which the Benedict Option is doubtlessly the most well-known in Europe by now. At the center of the Benedict Option is the idea that the triumph, triumph of leftist liberalism is such that Christians and traditionalists wanting to remain true to their convictions should segregate themselves to some degree from the majority society and form intentional communities inspired by Benedict of Nurscher's revolutionary attempt to form model societies on a reduced scale. Dear Rod, is there still a possibility to renovate academia from within or shouldn't we focus our efforts on the foundation of new institutions of learning and teaching in order to help us surviving the approaching dark ages? Yeah, thank you for the question. In um, my latest book, the one I've written since Benedict Option, it's called Live Not By Lies. And in it, I try to draw from the experience of, uh, of people from the former Soviet bloc uh, as to how we can meet this new totalitarianism uh, confidently and effectively. One of the people I draw on, whose wisdom I draw on, is Cheswolf Miłosz, who in his book, The Captive Mind, 1953, published in the US, said that uh, the people of Eastern Europe woke up one day to find that uh, ideas that were once uh, only spoken of in, among the radical fringe could be ruling their whole societies. And we have lived through that ourselves. Ten years ago, what we now call gender ideology 
was something that was only on the fringes of academia. Now, we are only a few votes away in the U.S. Congress from transgenderism being written into civil rights law in the U.S. Um, this has moved so quickly because cultural change happens when elites and elite networks take up ideas and spread them around their networks. So now, in virtually the blink of an eye, we have seen uh, uh, gender ideology, uh, critical social justice, these radical theories, move from the university out into every institution in American society, media, uh, big business, so-called woke capitalism, even now the U.S. military and the CIA. If you haven't seen on YouTube the CIA's new recruitment video, uh, you should go watch it. It's almost comic. It's, it's so unbelievably left-wing. But um, we on the right have been focused for 40 years at least on achieving political power, thinking that would be sufficient to protect us and protect our institutions. We have ignored culture, the power of culture and of cultural institutions. This was a serious mistake. And so now, as you've said, uh, Professor, and as Professor Kinnehink said, we have lost the university. Uh, I don't see personally that we can reform most universities because the way the ideology has, has gone into such extremes now that they don't only consider conservatives to be wrong, they consider us to be evil. So where does that leave us? Uh, I think that we conservatives, to go along with uh, what Alistair McIntyre said, I think we need to stop trying to shore up the imperium to try to reform universities that can't be reformed and won't be reformed. Instead, we have to form our own institutions within which we can lead a life of, uh, of virtue, of academic virtue, intellectual virtue, uh, to prepare ourselves for the long dark age ahead. This is, of course, what St. Benedict of Nursia did with his monasteries. He didn't set out to save Europe. He only set out to form communities where people could live out the faith in order and in a defensible way. Over the next 400 years, the slow work of the Benedictine monasteries revived Europe and laid the groundwork for the rebirth of civilization. I think in our time, in this collapse of the West and the collapse of the universities, we have to look at things, institutions like the Collegium Intimarium as a sort of academic monastery that within which the life of the mind can live on and in the future we can train elites here who will move out into the institutions of society and reform society. So God bless this university. It is in, uh, absolutely essential to the, the saving of our own civilization. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for explanations, dear, dear Rod. Last but not least, I will give the floor to John O'Sullivan as Andreas Kinniging, an old friend from the Vandenberg Society. John is a British conservative political commentator and journalist who, during the 1980s, was a senior policy writer and speechwriter for Margaret Thatcher when she was British Prime Minister and worked as former editor of the National Review. John O'Sullivan served also as executive editor of Radio Free Europe and is, since 2007, president of the Danube Institute in Budapest. Dear John, only some weeks ago we had a, a long discussion on the present state and future of conservatism throughout the West and quite agreed on a rather pessimistic outlook on the future, at least for Western Europe. In the East, however, it seems that the situation is not yet as bleak as in the West and I believe that the foundation of the Danube Institute as well as of the Collegium Intermarium is an obvious sign that there is still some form of hope. How would you assess the challenges and perspectives for new academic foundations in these last remnants of Western civilization? Thank you. It's all right. I think it's simply easier to speak on the platform. I don't have to juggle the papers and so on. So thank you. Uh, um, Pr Professor Engels, first of all, thank you very much for your kind words and secondly, for inviting me to be here on this occasion, which I think is an extremely important occasion um, and a really important sign of resistance to a dangerous 
an oppressive revolution that is now sweeping the entire uh, uh, entirety of Western civilization um, in both, on both sides of the Atlantic, in both halves of Europe. Um, almost all the ideas uh, and arguments I advance in this brief talk are views I've held for most of my life. Right. Previously, however, I held them in a kind of moderate or dispassionate way. Today, I find myself advancing them passionately, even angrily, because our educational and cultural institutions are now controlled increasingly by woke barbarians, not invaders from outside, but barbarians from within the walls of all the, these institutions. Um, and whereas I once would have lamented that we are living in a culture of loss, a culture of forgetfulness, a culture of amnesia, I think we now have to say that it is actually much more serious than that. We are living in a culture of what Robert, Roger Scruton called a culture of repudiation. We are deliberately repudiating all of the important uh, principles and values which have shaped our civilization and particularly our educational institutions and universities. And therefore I want to um, go back in this, these few remarks to the question of um, uh, what are the purposes of a liberal education. Uh, I deal with this at all levels, obviously with the university level, but also because at the moment we see the same revolution sweeping the secondary schools and even in fact the primary schools as well as tertiary education. Um, and, and we have to, in a sense, respond to it at those levels. Now, the first purpose of education, it seems to me, is the disinterested search for truth. That's why, ultimately, universities exist. That's obvious. And it should not itself be a subject of controversy. But matters do not quite end there. Uh, only a relatively uh, modest minority of students possesses either the talent uh, or the passion to be genuine scholars. Modern society, with its, uh, uh, doesn't really want to accept that. Its egalitarian ethos makes it reluctant to accept this limitation, and it seeks to direct more students into scholarly work than are suited to it. And that has bad effects on the students, very often, and on scholarship itself. I think it leads to the overproduction of research and to the creation of college disciplines that are largely dissociated from anything we would normally recognize as the search for truth, disciplines that soon morph into essentially propagandistic um, political activities in which only one side of an argument is permitted and dissenters from that argument excluded and marginalized. Most departments of gender studies and cultural studies fit into this uh, characterization. Sometimes they explicitly say so themselves. And because disinterested research sometimes establishes facts or provisional scientific truths that conflict with ideologies strong in the academy, that leads to the drift of scholarship towards the postmodern denial of truth itself and its replacement of truth with the notion of different but scholarly, different but equal scholarly perspectives and narratives. Um, and over time, of course, uh, those different perspectives uh, lead to uh, the argument that all that matters, well, that power has replaced truth as the prevailing object of inquiry. The second purpose of education is that it should prepare its graduates for the world of work, either giving them a specific body of knowledge needed to protect practice some particular uh, occupation, law or accountancy, but also instilling in all students a good general education uh, that will suffice them to prosper in life. Education does not seem to be doing that job we expect and used to receive. Um, too many graduates leave college with quite inadequate general skills, even down to the level of being able to write a literate and comprehensible letter. As for the acquisition of skills um, relevant to a particular job, one sign that colleges may be doing an inadequate job there is the large increase in recent decades in the number of students going on to study for PhDs or in law schools. Uh, it begins to look as though uh, further education, uh, postgraduate education, is beginning to uh, have to um, carry out the job that undergraduate hasn't 
carried out, just as uh, universities complain that the schools are not providing them with students um, who are capable of, um, well, who are capable of doing university work uh, without, um, without some kind of additional instruction. Um, a PhD, in my view, should not be regarded uh, as um, a necessary credential for most jobs outside the academy and certain specialized occupations. Uh, law schools should not function as intellectual finishing schools either. Their expansion is a consequence of the decline of undergraduate education and the consequence of that is prolonging the period of academic apprenticeship before the student goes out into the world of work, wrongly sometimes, expensively and perhaps counterproductively. Increasing the number of students without increasing the number of high quality jobs to which a degree almost automatically led when student numbers were lower is obviously a recipe for widespread social disappointment. It will swell the size of the unemployable and resentful intelligentsia, um, um, which as the distinguished historian Robert Conquest pointed out in his last book was one of the major causes of instability in Tsarist Russia and later in, this century, and later in the last century of instability and disruption in the Middle East. The third purpose of education is to transmit the values, traditions, and customs of a society to the next generation. Now that's something with which liberals of um, stripes from Mill to Spencer were uncomfortable with, and I think not without reason. Um, they were concerned that a single state education would in, in, in effect impose conformity upon a society that was likely in the end to result to obstruct truth and to prolong error and then ultimately would be a species of tyranny. They expressed those fears at a time when, compared to the day, there was much greater natural conformity uh, and fewer conflicting traditions in English society. Although, of course, the different divisions of Christianity struck them as going deep. At the same time, society, if though we might well be suspicious of the idea of um, transmitting traditions um, in, uh, through state institutions, at the same time, society needs unspoken and general agreement on a wide range of subjects. What is honesty, for instance, and when is it required? Or it will simply function less well. Indeed, it is an underlying moral consensus that creates a society, transforms a, um, a mere place uh, into a society where there otherwise would be an endless civil war between different religious come philosophical groups. Negotiating a consensus and understanding of what is the underlying moral cons consensus of a complex society is not a simple task. Maybe it's a task that is never finished, like painting the fourth bridge. But it can't be, certainly can't be achieved by a single system of state schools even when the moral consensus it teaches is one rooted in tolerance. I think, I, I think a good um, instructive example uh, here is the uh, uh, Horace Greeley's um, public schools in 19th century America. They performed the function of shaping a united American culture and a national personality from a culturally diverse group of immigrants. The Catholic Church believed that one effect, maybe one purpose, of Greeley's public schools was to raise a generation of good little Protestants. It therefore established its own school system. Fortunately, that system quite soon internalized the Protestant political values of Greeley's public schools. The dialogue between these two school systems both widened and strengthened the American system as a whole. The American people developed a common culture, a national identity, and a sense of common destiny, but in ways that accommodated significant differences of religious belief. That accommodation rested ultimately on a free market in religion and the absence of a state religion, but it was the, but it was the result of a dialogue between two forms of Christian belief. Now, will such an outcome prove possible within the wider range of beliefs found in a multicultural society? Or uh, will it prove possible when the government thinks that the purpose of an education is to inculcate a single set of political, social, and philosophical beliefs for the sake of social stability? 
That certainly seems to be the case in some West European countries. Uh, uh, people from these countries might want to contradict me if I'm wrong here, but it seeks, strikes me that the hostility uh, of both the Swedish and German political systems to homeschooling in the Swedish case on grounds, um, pres pres grounds that they may uh, inculcate values in children very different from those of social democracy means that these are live questions. They exist in the school system and in the university system. Now, how do we overcome in these circumstances the culture of repudiation that now controls both schools and universities? I don't know to what extent everybody here has noticed the degree to which recently in America there have been a succession of scandals about the ways in which, because parents have discovered that their schools are teaching their children. Uh, th these are, these are upper-class American prep schools like Brearley um, and uh, one, an Anglican state school, Grace Church School in New York, um, which are essentially teaching the extremes of woke religion, a, a repudiation of the concept of America, claims that white supremacy uh, are, is the basis of that country, that America is an endemically racist society, um, and in the whole panoply of, of woke uh, con convictions. Um, and, um, and this is being done in expensive schools, which people in the past had provided, had bought their children that education because they thought it would give them a good liberal education as well as inculcating specific uh, religious views. Now, um, what can we do about this? It seems to me, of course, uh, a gentleman, professor spoke before, gave a, a number of arguments. As he uh, said, however, um, we are limited to the degree to which we are able to intervene directly to ensure the, the, um, the continuation of, of in, in universities uh, of a variety of, of intelligent views and a, a genuine debate. Um, I think obviously uh, as, uh, as, as this occasion illustrates very strongly, um, what we need to do uh, is to have um, we, the power of the alternative, the power of example. Um, we do not want to impose uh, other, we do not want to impose uh, on existing universities and institutions uh, a kind of state control that would be opinion control, philosophy control, tradition control. It's not what we are about. Um, the only way that in a liberal society, classical liberal society, we are going to achieve this uh, is if the kind of education um, uh, that we provide in the collegium is one that persuades everybody else that that is what they want and that by the excellence of that education reveals the flaws in the, uh, in the, existing, in the existing universities. Um, that won't be enough perhaps, but it will be a great deal. I think um, the, uh, as we came in today, you probably noticed we passed some demonstrators. They were holding up signs which said, education without indoctrination. Well, of course, that is what we are advancing here. As to who is advancing it most sincerely, I think we can solve that by asking the question, who are shout, which group is shouting down their opponents? Which group refuses to hire people with whom they, whom they respect intellectually, but whose political views they dislike. Um, which uh, group intends to allow its students to examine the, the, good, the great books on both sides of debate? Um, which students, uh, which, which, doc, which set of people intends to um, enforce a particular point of view to the point of, of firing people uh, or marking them down when they produced perfectly good academic work. I think we know the answer to those questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, dear John. As uh, time has already progressed very far, my closing remarks will have to be very short. I think the, the general diagnosis has been very clear. The threat to the freedom of speech and research in the Western world is real and dangerous. And it is essentially rooted in the radicalization of the leftist liberal ideology and its increasing influence on academia. It is also obvious that it is our duty to resist this pressure, be it by documenting the growing number of flagrant attacks on free speech and free research, be it by defending the diversity of existing structures, be it by creating new institutions. These institutions would have to shape a new outlook on academia by avoiding the errors of the past, by renewing with the best traditions of our Western civilization, and most important, by leaving behind the errors of relativism and cynicism while, once again, putting the question of truth into the middle of our endeavors. A truth which we will never be able to fully grasp and comprehend, but which we have to presuppose as factually existing in order to be able to approach it. Thank you very much for your kind attention, dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and many thanks to our distinguished guests. We'd also like to thank the oral guests. It was Professor David Engels and the guests in the first panel. I ask you to put your signs on the declaration, please. If you want, of course. Paneliści złożyli podpisy pod deklaracją od nowym. A my, proszę Państwa, zaczynamy kolejny panel. And now we're moving on to the second panel. Klasycznych wartości. The place of classical values in the postmodernist, postmodern world. And the host, the moderator of this panel is Mr. Stephen Thompson, public relations consultant. O przybycie tutaj do nas i przedstawienie Please come here to us and present the guests of this panel, including, uh, among others, Professor Andrzej Zybertowicz, as well as guests from abroad who will be with us online. Może poproszę o pomoc, bo chyba nie mamy gospodarza. Może jest na zewnątrz tej sali, pije kawę czy herbatę, gdyby ktoś był tak miły. Please may I ask the host of this panel to come here, maybe he's outside. Szukał naszego and drinking coffee, please. Żebyśmy mogli w miarę punktualnie zacząć. So that, we, so that we can start on time. No właśnie, ja proszę pana Stefana Thompsona, ale, ale chyba mnie nie słyszy. Bo gdyby był na sali, to pewnie by już tutaj stał. <laughs> czy pan Stefan Thompson jest tutaj wśród nas, czy mnie słyszy? Stefan Thompson, are you here? Can you hear us? We are waiting for you. Ale uciekł. A, uciekł wywiadu. Stefan Thompson udziela wywiadu, więc musimy poczekać siłą rzeczy kilka minut. Mam nadzieję, że to będą dwie, trzy minuty, a nie pięć. Uh, we have to wait a few minutes, so please uh, don't go away. Drugi panel, miejsce We are facing our second panel, the place of the classical values in the postmodern uh, world. 